on several occasions between 1996 and 1999, alleged Flight 77 hijacker Hani Hanjur attends flight schools in Arizona. The 9-11 Commission will later note, quote, it is clear that when Hanjur lived in Arizona in the 1990s, he associated with several individuals who have been the subject of counterterrorism investigations, end quote. Some of the time, he is accompanied by two friends, Bandar al-Hazmi and Rayed Abdullah. Bandar al-Hazmi and Rayed Abdullah have been friends with each other in high school in Saudi Arabia, but it is not known if either knew Hanjour before moving to the United States. Al-Hazmi and Hanjour are roommates for a time. Al-Hazmi will finish his training and leave the United States for the last time in January of 2000. He apparently will be interviewed by the FBI overseas in 2004. Rayed Abdullah becomes a leader of the Phoenix Mosque, where he reportedly gives extremist speeches. He will continue to train with Hani Anjur occasionally through the summer of 2001. The FBI apparently will investigate him in May of 2001. He will repeatedly be questioned by federal authorities after 9-11, then move to Qatar. In 2004, the 9-11 Commission will report that the FBI remains suspicious of al-Hazmi and Abdullah, but neither man is charged with any crime. The 9-11 Commission will also imply that another of Han Jor's Arizona associates is al-Qaeda operative Ghassan al-Sharbi. Al-Sharbi will be arrested in Pakistan in March of 2002 with al-Qaeda leader Abu Zubaydah. He apparently is a target of Phoenix FBI agent Ken Williams' Phoenix memo. Another associate of Honduras, Hamid al-Sulami, is in telephone contact with a radical Saudi imam who is said to be the spiritual advisor to Abu Zubaydah. This imam may have had a role in recruiting some of the 9-11 hijackers. Abdul Aziz Alamari, for instance, was a student of this imam, and it seems that all Suleiman is also a target of Ken Williams' Phoenix memo. In 1998, an American Caucasian Muslim named Orki Collins later says he reports to the FBI on Hani Hanjour for six months in 1998. The FBI later acknowledges that they pay Orki Collins to monitor the Islamic and Arab communities in Phoenix between the years 1996 and 1999. He also was an informant overseas and once had an invitation to meet with Osama bin Laden in mid of 1998. Collins claims that he is a casual acquaintance of Hani Anjur while he was taking flying lessons. Collins sees nothing suspicious about Hanjur as an individual, but he does tell the FBI about him because Hanjur appears to be part of a larger organized group of Arabs taking flying lessons. He says the FBI knew everything about the guy, including his exact address, phone number, and even what car he drove. The FBI denies Collins told them anything about Ani Anjur and denies knowing about Hanjur before 9-11. Hawkey Collins would be noted in an ABC News article dated June 23rd 2002. Collins later calls Hanjour a hanky panky hijacker. He wasn't even moderately religious, let alone fanatically religious. And I knew for a fact that he wasn't part of Al Qaeda or any other Islamic organization. He couldn't even spell jihad in Arabic. Collins would later tell the New York Times that he worked with the FBI agent Ken Williams who will write the Phoenix memo expressing concerns about radical militants attending Arizona flight schools. He says that he quarrels with Ken Williams and quits helping him. It is unknown if Williams ever learns about Hanjour before 9-11. Collins closely matches the description of the informant who first alerted Ken Williams to Zachariah Subra, a flight student who will be the main focus of Ken Williams' memo. If this is so, it bolsters Orky Collins' claims that he knew Hani Hanjour 
because many of Subra's friends, including his roommate and Al-Qaeda operative, Ghassan al-Sharbi, also know Hani Anjur. After 9-11, Collins will claim that based on his experience with the FBI and CIA, he is 100% sure that some people in those agencies knew about the 9-11 attack in advance and let it happen. Collins will later quote, just think about it. How could a group of people plan such a big operation full of so many logistic and probably countless emails, encrypted or not, and phone calls and messengers? And you're telling me that through all of that, that the CIA never caught wind of it? <laughs> 